Okay, welcome back, Ling Statisticians. Uh, today we're going to talk about two different but related things, uh, the first of which is box plots, and the second of which is outliers. Um, and we'll keep the discussion going on these two topics as we move forward beyond this lecture as well, which is why I want you to know them. So basically, let's start off, where were we? Uh, after our last lecture, we had learned about the five number summary of a distribution, which includes um, these five numbers, the minimum, value in a distribution, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the maximum value of that distribution. Uh, and basically the reason box plots exist is to present that information in graphical form. Uh, so without any further ado, let's just, this is what a box plot represents. It's gonna show you the median of a distribution with a thick solid black line. Um, R is gonna plot these all out in black and white. You can tweak the colors if you really want to, but I'm gonna be boring and just show them to you in the most basic form. Uh, but the median will be plotted with a thick solid black line. The first and third quartiles will form a box around the median. Uh, and then there's going to be whiskers on the box that extend out to the maximum and minimum values of the distribution. Okay, so those are the three things basically we're trying to get, or five numbers boiled down into sort of like three properties of the graph. Uh, so I'm going to show you what this looks like using R. So um, I've got, sorry about this, this is a tiny font that I'm using for this command here. Um, but I'll post these later in case you want to try this out yourself. I just wanted to fit it all onto one line. Um, so I'm going to show you how to make a box plot from that height data, uh, that men's and women's height data that we looked at a little while ago. Uh, so, right, um, there, that's how you load it in. I'm going to make, again, I'm going to make a separate video on these basic commands of how to read data into R, into what's called a data frame. Uh, this is kind of a nice way of doing it. I'll just pause for a second um, because I have this data on a web link here. Originally, again, I got it from the Introduction to the Practice of Statistics textbook. So again, thanks guys uh, for making that available. Um, but I posted it to a web link. Um, if you go to the course web page, if you go under data sets, this, these are the links I posted a couple of years ago for the previous rendition of this class. But if you follow this men's and women's height link, it'll show you this information, right? We've seen it before. Uh, and the nice part of R is that it can, you can just grab it from the same web link um, wherever you happen to be, as long as you have that internet connection. Uh, and so usually the first thing you wanna do once you get some data into your R console is to take a look at like, is there actually data there? And one good way to do that is using the summary command We've seen this before because uh, we talked about how it kind of calculates the quartile um, information a little bit differently from sort of the five number summary command. Uh, but basically this shows you um, the overall like facts, the five basic facts along with the mean uh, for the different columns in this data set. The observation, <clears throat> which is really not that interesting, um, and then the data for both men and women. Uh, so observation just goes from one to 100. So that might make it easy to kind of see, well, we've got the minimum at, minimum at one, the maximum at 100, so on and so forth. It's more informative to look at, say, men's heights and say, well, the minimum for height is 63 inches, the maximum is 77 inches, so on and so forth. Um, okay, so the data is in there, um, but if we compare this these numbers to um, the five number summaries for both columns, men and women, uh, we find for men, they match up. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm all choked up about heights. So uh, for men, they match up uh, in terms of the quartile calculations, but for the women, they do not. Um, and again, that's for technical reasons that I'm not gonna bother to go into in great detail in this video series. But um, there's a difference here, is that uh, in the summary command, it gives you a first quartile value of 62.75. And the five numbers summary command, it gives you a value of 62.5. Everything else is the same as it should be, really. But um, what is gonna happen when we actually look at the box plot command in R is that it's gonna plot the numbers we get um, in the five number summary. So normally, like when I load data into R, I just do this summary command, just say, oh, is it there? What does it look like? Is it functioning properly, basically? I don't care that specifically about these individual values normally, uh, but for instructional purposes, I wanna kind of just focus on it for a second to make it clear that the box plot is going to operate on this set of numbers here, or this set of numbers for the men as well what you get out of that five number summary. So let's take a look at the box plot of male heights first. I'll go to uh, the next slide. Um, so I've got the output here um, in my 
PowerPoint slide, but this is the command you use. We'll, we'll come back to the slide here in a second. Um, so this one's pretty straightforward. The name of the command is box plot, uh, and you put the relevant parameters in parentheses inside of it. Um, I can do it the simplest way first. Maybe I should do that um, without any sort of uh, labeling. So if I just say, uh, give me the box plot for the men's height, height data, uh, the way you specify that, um, again, I'll be get into this more when I um, talk about the R commands in a separate video, but I'm looking at the height data frame, and then it's specifying that it wants basically the men's column, uh, the column labeled men. Uh, and this little dollar sign indicates this is a variable, um, a column name that you can sort of pick out in this fashion, uh, the men column from the height data frame. Just give me a box plot for that data, uh, and then when I hit return after typing that command into the R console, it'll spit out this graph, this five, uh, this box plot, which represents the five number summary for this particular data set. Um, you might have to sort of size it a little bit if you really want to uh, see all the different all the relevant information down here at the bottom of the graph. That's not a problem for this one because I didn't put anything down there. But this basically shows you. Um, what we can expect based on this five number summary and what I told you about um, box plots and how they work. So we've got this thick solid black line here at 70, which is the median value for the distribution. And then we've got this nice symmetric uh, box around that line going from 68 for the first quartile to 72 for the third quartile over there. Uh, and then it's got these whiskers kind of extended out um, to the top and bottom of the distribution, 63 on the low end and 77 on the high end. Um, and that looks exactly the same from um, as what we can see here in uh, the PowerPoint slide. The only difference is that I added this label on the Y axis to indicate um, what's actually being plotted there, uh, specifying my units basically. Uh, so yeah, I mean, right. We made a lot more comp uh, complicated than this, but um, I'll show you just exactly how that's done um, by copying and pasting what other people have done, namely myself. Uh, so if you want to add that label to the y-axis, the way you do it is um, the parameter is called y-lab like this, and you just say what it's equal to. What you want to have labeled is within these um, quotation marks. Um, so that's pretty straightforward, and I'll just do it again. Whoops, <laughs> should have worked. Uh, Da, 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 da. Why didn't that work? Maybe I'll do this. Um, uh, well, maybe I'm gonna have to edit this out of the video uh, and figure out why I did the, why this went wrong when I thought I had used this just fine a second ago when I put these slides together. All right, I'm gonna slog through this for a second and I might edit this later. I don't know why that's happening. Um, but I've got this, it might be, da, da, da. that's working. Might be something I copied over from PowerPoint. Yeah, that's what's going on. Uh, so there was some sort of secret character that was messing me up there. Um, yeah, I'll just keep this simple here. Um, hopefully I can do this. Inches. Yeah, no problem. I don't know why that happened. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but <laughs> worst comes to worst, you just build things up from scratch, I guess. Yeah, maybe it was the computer programming gods to tell me that don't tell people to just copy and paste other people's work. As I was making that joke, uh, even if that other person is yourself, uh, make sure you understand everything from the bottom up. I'm not going to say anything more about this slide, but I will point out that um, here's where that label appears over on this side. So again, uh, a general principle of any sort of graph is you always need to specify your units if you're going to tell people like numbers in some form on the graph. So don't forget to do that. That's the only reason I was sort of dwelling on that for the moment. Um, the next slide uh, I wanted to show you was the ladies graph uh, for the female heights, right? So um, actually I'll just keep stick an R here um, and just change this. So you can change female height and then specify the column as women. Uh, and then that'll pick out the right data set. And then uh, it's not 
switching over to the graph immediately as I do that, but uh, I can always just change my which window I'm looking at to see that this is the um, the women's height here. Um, yeah, so nothing super spectacular going on here, except that I do want to kind of go back to this five number summary and show you how things match up. So the median is 64. So we've got that here. Um, I'm going to gloss over the quartiles for a second and say the minimum is at 58. So we can see that right there. And the maximum is 71. We got that as well. Um, and then uh, the third quartile value is 66. Uh, that matches up here. That's the top of the box. And then the um, bottom or the first quartile is the 62.5 value in the five number summary. And then there's a little bit of a discrepancy because that's 62.75 in the summary um, command. And when you look at this, you're like, is this 62 and a half or 62.75? I can't really tell. Um, so sorry about that. And this is why it's maybe not that big of a deal, but just so you understand um, what it's doing, if we zoom in, um, we can get a better view of that lower end of the box. So I've already done that uh, separately, putting this slide together. And you can see when you do that, uh, the actual value of the first quartile in the box plot is 62 and a half. And I wanna do that um, using this command here. Uh, so you can see how I did it in case you ever have a need to do so yourself. Um, but what I'm gonna add here, and I'll do it by hand rather than copying and pasting is, um, I'm going to specify what range the y-axis has. So I'm going to specify it by um, just adding this parameter, ylim. So before I was adding a label, ylab, and now I'm going to add uh, the range, ylim, the limits, I guess, on the numbers on that y-axis. And I'm going to go from 62 on the low end to 63 on the high end, so I can really see where that first quartile is being plotted. And the c just means that's combine that together into a range. Uh, so I do that and it plots, you have to switch over to the window um, and then you can see the same information here, maybe a little bit better. The first quartile is 62 and a half, not 62.75, which would be up there. Um, I'm gonna say as well on my computer, on a Mac, that um, this is plotting out in nice graphical form. Uh, if you wanna save it, you can save it as a PDF. Uh, you could, you know, um, see it's just R plot as the default name. Uh, I've already like saved some of these uh, graphics from before when I was making the slides, uh, but you can name it whatever you want, right? So example box plot or something like that. Um, yeah, so it's PDF, which is not like the most, um, I guess, typical image format you might use. You might prefer using like JPEG or GIF, GIF, whatever. Uh, but you know, you can also, if you really want to use a, um, you know, like take a screenshot or something like that, but that's the sort of built-in function that R gives you is to basically save it as a PDF. And I think it works differently on a PC. So I'm not going to speak for that side of things. Um, I think that might actually wind up giving you a specific image format rather than portable document format format, uh, portable document file. I don't know. It's been a while since I had to geek out about stuff like that. So I won't belabor the point any further. Uh, and then I'll just kind of reiterate that what we're getting out of this it, box plot function is a representation of the five number summaries for the different distributions. Okay, um, there is a caveat to this though, the way this works. So the caveat to the basic rules for drawing box plots is that R is not going to extend the whiskers out to data points that it considers to be outliers. Like I said, we're going to be talking about box plots and then outliers. So here we go. This is part two of this lecture. Uh, and the tricky part is we uh, box plots are nice and clearly defined. We know exactly what they represent. But um, outliers are things that people talk about a lot, but there's no easy way to describe them. Um, the basic idea is that an outlier is a data point that's so extreme in your distribution that you have reason to suspect that maybe it's a faulty representation uh, or a misrepresentative measurement. Maybe something went wrong when you collected that data point, or else maybe you've got some incredibly exceptional sort of moment in time that you've caught uh, in your data set for whatever reason. Um, it's just sort of odd enough compared to the rest of the data that you might think that it's not sort of showing you the same sort of basic underlying features that the rest of the data is. Um, like there was a book that came out uh, a while back by Malcolm Gladwell, which was interesting to read. I think it's the only book I've ever read by Malcolm Gladwell, but um, it was called Outliers. <clears throat> I think I've read two. 
that Outliers was the better one, but it was basically about um, how people can perform exceptionally well in some discipline. Um, and he was looking at like various reasons why that might be the case. And one case I'll, I'll remember um, as a, a linguist working in Canada is talking about like Wayne Gretzky as an exceptional hockey player. Uh, so like Wayne Gretzky, if you look at his career numbers, those, at least when he retired, were outliers. Like he had, I can't remember the specific numbers. The one that's jumping in my head is like 2,832 points, like in his career. I'm just guessing. Uh, I should look that up though now that I'm talking about this. But, and I think the second person uh, in the, you know, the stack of career points is like 1967 or something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be silly and actually look this up. World Almanac. I've been looking at these things ever since I was a little kid. Uh, anyways, Wayne Gretzky was so far off the scale that there was reason to think that maybe, you know, he was exceptional. <laughs> so the, like his records are legitimate. Uh, and we don't think he was on steroids or anything like that, but, um, you know, that's, he was an outlier is what he's called, right? Cause there's nobody close to him basically. Uh, and Malcolm Gladwell was looking at like, are there reasons why this is the case? And he talked about hockey specifically because, um, they found that like, uh, when kids go through the hockey system in Canada, like they, there's a bias towards kids who are born early in the year because, uh, everybody's grouped by year, um, going through like peewees and juniors. And then like the kids who are slightly older within that group are they better to begin with because they're slightly bigger and more mature. And then they get more attention paid to them, so on and so forth. So it's like a positive feedback loop. So how far off was I? This is a matter of personal pride. This does not matter to you in any point. Okay. So it's not 2832. Wayne Gretzky was 2857. Number two is Yarmir Yager who played for forever and he's 1921. So, right. That's a number that's like out there. Uh, can't believe I spent so much time talking about hockey. Anyways, in a box plot, R is going to display these values as individual points. Um, so they won't be like part of the whiskers or the box. They're just going to be individual little circles in the graph itself. And when you see those, uh, if you're really dedicated to like actual science, not just watching sports on TV, then uh, you ought to check them out just to make sure that nothing has gone wrong in the data collection process for those particular measurements. Um, so uh, I uh, will also make a caveat or give you a caveat to that sort of pronouncement as well, because I had a grad student who collected um, a big batch of data for her MA thesis, uh, and she was very assiduous and very careful as well. And then but she wound up with a lot of a lot of data points that were like beyond the whiskers that looked like outliers in her data. And then she went through and checked like every single one. Uh, like if there seems to be a pattern of outliers, then maybe something else is going on. You don't have to like look at every single individual point. Uh, but instead, uh, I'll give you some more examples of what outliers look like um, based on sort of the formula that um, R uses to plot these things. Um, and we don't necessarily have to check them all one by one, but I'll explain more what I mean by that by the time we get to the end of this. So um, to identify potential outliers, box plots in R will only extend whiskers out to 1.5 times the interquartile range beyond the lines for the first and third quartiles. Okay, that's a mouthful. Uh, what does that mean? It's easier to say it in math. Um, so basically the maximum value for the whisker on the top of a box plot is the third quartile value plus one and a half times the interquartile range. Uh, and then if we go on the other side, then we see the minimum value for the whisker on the bottom of the box plot is the first quartile value minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. So how, that's how far away from the box itself that you're going to go with these whiskers potentially um, is that one and a half times the interquartile range. So uh, skip hockey, skip heights, skip whatever, skip Malcolm Gladwell for the moment we'll go back to the peapod data um, where uh, we can calculate specifically where we'd expect these whiskers to be. Um, so uh, I'll show you the whole range of data here in a second, but uh, we'll skip to sort of the calculations for this slide. So my first and third quartiles uh, for my peapod data from back in the day, six was the first quartile, seven and a half was the third quartile. It, the interquartile range, seven and a half minus six is one and a half. So the max or sort of minimum value, the whisker on the bottom could extend out to is six minus one and a half times one and a half. And that's 3.75. Likewise, on the high end, um, it could extend out to seven and a half plus one and a half times one and a half, which turns out to be 9.75. Um, the math works out in a similar fashion for Svetlana's data, except that her first quartile is seven and a half. 
her high um, third quartile is eight. Um, and so that gives you an interquartile range of just one half, right? Um, so it's gonna give you uh, a smaller range for these whiskers that goes from 6.75 on the low end to 8.75 on the high end. Um, yeah, so in my case, or the case of the Steve Peapod data, that range will encompass all of the observed data going from 3.75 to 9.75. All my Peapods had a set of P's in it within that range. For Svilana though, um, she had um, a couple of Peapods with only four P's in them, and then one with uh, nine Peapods in it, or nine P's in it. It would, yeah, it was <laughs> a recursive Peapod uh, with Peapods in it, who knows? Um, Calgary's an amazing place and my wife is a lucky woman. But the point is that uh, she had outliers um, in her data set or things that R is gonna plot as outliers. So it's gonna plot four as a little dot um, and it's gonna plot nine as a dot by itself as well, not within the range of those whiskers, which actually for Svetlana winds up being pretty narrow because her interquartile range is so narrow. Um, so here's what it looks like. Um, this is just showing you the ordered data for the P pod sets. Um, and you can see that Svetlana's um, goes from four on the low end to nine on the high end. And I've got the median here and then the first and third quartiles where they fall in each data set. So we can see those match up pretty well to um, the box plots as they should, right? So it's easiest to see maybe for my data set where my first quartile is at six down here on the low end, my median's at seven right here. That's where the thick black line is. And then seven and a half is the third quartile up here. Uh, and so the, then the funny part is that um, in this case, my box plot only has one whisker uh, and it's only the one on the top. <coughs> so if we go back to the previous slide for a sec, it was saying um, my whiskers should extend out to 3.75 to nine on the low end to 9.75 on the high end. Um, the trick is though, uh, my minimum is the same as my first quartile. So my minimum value is six, my first quartile value is six as well. So there's actually no need to extend a whisker out here down to like 3.75. Uh, so R just doesn't do anything there. It just doesn't plot a whisker at all to say, well, there's no data there. Um, everything, the minimum is the first quartile is what that's telling you basically. Um, it does need to extend the high end a little bit up to eight because that's my maximum. That is slightly higher than the third quartile. Uh, and then in um, Svetlana's case, you see something kind of similar uh, at the high end here. So the third quartile value for Svetlana is the same as her median. It's eight in both cases. So the top of the box um, matches up with the thick black line, which is the median. Um, and then what you see on top of that is that she does get this whisker on the low end for her um, value of seven. So seven divided by eight is seven and a half. That's her first quartile. So her whisker is gonna stretch out to seven here. But remember the limit here was 6.75 for Svetlana. So it'll extend out to that seven. It won't go to 6.75 cause there's not actually any data point at 6.75. Just saying, well, there's one peapod that has seven peas. Um, and then it leaves these other two just as dots. Um, so I'm, this, um, these slides walk you through the um, facts I just told you um, over and over again, but Steve's lower whisker and Svetlana's upper whisker do not extend past the edges of their respective boxes. Uh, so just because it's a box plot doesn't mean it's gonna have whiskers. And in fact, the funny thing is that this median doesn't even ex extend out to like a higher part of the box. Uh, the median is just the top of the box. Um, yeah, so uh, the point though I wanna focus on for the moment is the outliers themselves. Um, so we've got this maximum value of nine for Svetlana. So we've got one dot out there. Uh, and then we have two values of four, but note that R uh, in its default form is only gonna plot one outlier there. So it's got one circle, uh, basically representing both of these points of four. Uh, in either way, they don't fall into the whiskers or the box itself of the box plot. Uh, it's just showing you, well, there's, there's stuff out there. Um, don't ignore it basically, uh, but it's a little bit weird because it's so extreme. Um, okay, so just to review in each box plot, the median is displayed with a thick solid line. Uh, the first and third quartiles form a box around the median. And then we also get whiskers extending out to the maximum and min minimum values of the distribution with limits um, based on this math, which I'm not gonna walk through again, but it's based on where the quartiles are and the interquartile range on top of that, or 
on below of that, <laughs> on bottom of that, I guess. Uh, anyways, uh, the other point I want to get across or make sure it gets across is the box plot is only going to plot these features for data that is actually there. It doesn't plot any pure abstractions. So if we go back, uh, this might take a while, but uh, like the the whisker range for Svilana was supposed to be 6.75 on the low end. It doesn't uh, stretch this whisker on the bottom end out to 6.75. It says, well, there's a data point at seven. We'll just stop there. Um, it's not plotting like abstractions based on the data. It's plotting there is a data point here. So there is some observation. That's what the purpose of this is. Um, okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And then if you wind up with a weird looking box plot for your own data, maybe that'll help make your weird box plot look a little bit more sensible because it's following this set of rules basically. Um, okay, so a little more about outliers. I want to uh, briefly take a closer look at something more uh, language related uh, rather than um, Canadian sports related uh, by going back to the how many languages do you speak data set, which I talked about a little while ago. Uh, so to get us back into the uh, swing of things, I've ordered the answers to that question. Uh, this is the answers I got three years ago for this class uh, from smallest to largest in this box to the left. Um, and I'm showing you how many languages, uh, these are the, the initials of the various students in the class. Uh, and then this is how many languages they spoke. Uh, and then this, these numbers on the left are just like in order. Um, yeah, so uh, from you know lowest to highest. And there's 11 students uh, and the numbers of languages they speak ranges from one on the low end to seven on the high end. Uh, so the interesting question you could ask maybe is are any of these data points outliers, uh, at least by the definition used for our box plots? Um, and normally I do this in class just kind of as an exercise for everybody to work through together. Uh, and we just crunch through the math um, to see if we can get it to work ourselves. I'm going to do it for you on this video. But if you want to, you can pause the video here and work out the math yourself um, to see what you come up with. And maybe we'll wind up in the same place. Uh, and if you don't, you might want to watch the video again from here on out. Uh, so the first kind of question we need to answer in order to figure out the answer to this question in the third bullet point is what numbers will we need to calculate in order to answer this question? OK, so uh, the outliers uh, are going to basically be, as far as our box plots are concerned, the outliers are going to be determined by how far above and below the distribution the whiskers can extend to, right? So we need to figure out what are those limits for the whiskers. And to figure that out, we need to know what the quartile values are and what the interquartile range is, right? So let's walk through that math. Um, it's relatively simple, but it's good to kind of know how to do it. So let's start by calculating the first and third quartiles for this data set. Um, and the trick here is uh, one I mentioned before, which is that this data set has an odd number of values uh, in the sample. So it's got 11. Um, so instead of having 12, which we can kind of cleave right in the middle, uh, we need to decide whether or not to include the sort of median value six in our quartile calculation. So the median value is two specifically because um, this is the actual value in the middle of this distribution. Uh, but we don't know, should this six be included on both halves when we're calculating the quartiles or should it not? Um, if you're clever and quick, maybe you've already noticed that it actually wouldn't really matter. Uh, if we included it in the end, we'd still get the same values for the first and third quartiles, which is kind of reassuring, but not necessarily always going to be the case. Uh, but at any rate, uh, let's include it just for kicks because it's going to be something different that we haven't quite done before uh, so we can see how it works. Um, all right, so on both halves, we're going to get this value number six, uh, which means that the top half, or sorry, yeah, top half, which is the lower numbers, um, is going to be values one through six, and then the bottom half will be values six through 11. Uh, all right, so like I said, I'm going to do the math for you. Here's our top half for the first quartile. We've got six values in it. We split that itself in the middle as well between values three and fourth, both of which are equal to one. So that makes our lives simple. If we take the average or the mean of that, it's just going to be one. So that's our first quartile. Um, and then the second, or sorry, um, the third quartile calculations will involve these numbers from 6 through 11, uh, values 6 through 11, which range from 2 to 7. What we want to do is look at what's in the middle there, um, which is values 8 and 9. 
and those are both equal to three. So that makes our life uh, a little simpler as well. Uh, so we've got a third quartile value of just three. So on the low end, we got one. On the high end, we have three. All right, and then what does that make our interquartile range class? Think about it for a second. And hopefully you came up with two because that's three minus one equals two. <clears throat> right, so it shouldn't be too hard to go from there to where we can expect the um, ranges of the whiskers to extend out to. Um, I'll give you the math for the lower whisker, which winds up being kind of silly because uh, like our first quartile value is one. Uh, and then we can extend the whisker out to one minus 1.5 times two. Uh, 1.5 times 2 itself is 3. If you have 1 minus 3, you get negative 2, which is a silly number to have in this context because nobody could possibly speak negative 2 languages. That makes no sense. And in fact, if you are a grad student in a stats course for linguists um, at you know a major research university, you're probably going to speak at least one language. Um, so it, yeah. Uh, we don't really need to have any whiskers extending below, below that value of one in this box plot whatsoever. Uh, so we'll just say this is with the way the math would work out, but this is also kind of to reinforce that point that R is not gonna plot out just some abstraction just for math's sake. Uh, it's not gonna extend a whisker out to negative two languages because that makes no sense and we would never have an observation there, right? Uh, so we're just kind of done with that lower end of the, the scale. Uh, the upper whisker, though, um, is interesting, though, because the third quartile value is 3, and we add to that 1.5 times 2, the interquartile range. This 1.5 times 2 equals 3 itself. Add that to 3, and we get 6. Uh, so that's the limit for our upper whisker, but there's actually one student here, um, number 11, uh, in the distribution who reported speaking more than six languages. So um, student BN has seven. Right, so that's an outlier, right? at least if, according to this scheme for um, plotting box plots. Uh, and if you actually do uh, look at the box plot for this data, you get something that looks like this. It extends the whisker out to six. We've got the first quartile at one, the third quartile at three. We've got the median at two, all this stuff that we figured out. And this one lonely data point up here at seven, which is an outlier of some sort. Um, so when you get to this point, uh, you could stop and say, well, is that a legitimate data point? Like, what is this seven telling us? Did something, you know, maybe get messed up in the process? Uh, this is reminding me, I meant to, I think, mention this earlier. Uh, I told you about my one MA student who, like, got lots of outliers in her data set and checked every single one of them. Um, I, another example I can give you is uh, a PhD student who just recently finished, uh, who did his uh, thesis on uh, VOT in Swahili. Uh, and he um, had a lot of amazing stories to tell about collecting data in Tanzania and um, Kenya for his thesis and a variety of other places too as well, uh, which didn't get reported in the final product. But he at some point put, um, what he wanted to do is to get recordings of Kenyan speakers producing various words in Swahili. Uh, sorry, yeah, various people in Kenya who speak Swahili recording themselves um, speaking Swahili words. Uh, so you have this thing set up where they would like look at pictures of animals or objects or whatever, and then they just say what that animal or object was. Um, and he had this one location he wanted to get this data from uh, in the interior of Kenya. Uh, I think he was in, I don't want to get my locations messed up, but he was in Nairobi, and he wanted to go to this town in the interior, uh, Iringa, I believe it was called, and he had no way of getting there, but he somehow knew a guy, he made a contact with a guy. Uh, who said he could do it for him. So my student just gave this guy um, his laptop and said, please run this experiment for me. Uh, and the guy was like, sure. And he took a bus ride out there. And, you know, if I would have done that, I might have thought I might never see that laptop again. But guess what? The guy ran the experiment, brought the laptop back. Um, and, you know, which was great for the whole thesis. Uh, but <laughs> the problem was um, the data was not real. So one place where you might get outliers that um, kind of, don't make sense is in uh, reaction time experiments. So uh, he also had another condition in his uh, study where he was, you know, playing like tokens with different VOT in them, and then people had to like picture or select between one or two pictures to say, well, that what that person said matches up with this picture rather than this one. Uh, and it turns out people were just like clicking through blah 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 really super fast because he was getting reaction times of like 50 milliseconds or less than 100 milliseconds, which if you were trying to do this, it would take you longer to do it. 
you would know um, that you could not possibly get a reaction time that fast. Uh, so that's one case where the data would go wrong uh, when you see a reaction time that's just too fast for human beings to normally do. Um, but uh, so you can take that data and say, well, maybe we shouldn't include this in the final analysis because it doesn't make sense. Um, and I will say before I move on from this story that uh, kudos to the dude in Kenya who like ran my student's uh, dissertation experiment for him just basically out of the goodness of his heart because, you know, that's an amazing thing to do for somebody you don't really know. Uh, the problem is that you do kind of need experience in running experiments to get like the data you want out of them. Um, so uh, the first time you do that, especially if you have no interest in linguistics, whatever, it might not go right. But that might happen to you even if you do have interest in linguistics and are just kind of working your way through grad school. Uh, it takes some practice to figure out how to get the data you want. And also, as we know from this class, how to you know figure out what it's telling you, um, what that those numbers mean. Uh, so sorry for the long digression, but uh, I wanted to mention that because we're going to wind up in Kenya at the end of this, um, sort of in Kenya at the end of this lecture anyways. So I wanted to say, let's go to Kenya more than once. Um, seems like an interesting place. Anyways, uh, the, going back to this data set, we have um, one student who said that they speak seven languages. Um, this is based on this question, how many languages do you speak? Uh, so. Like I put this question on the background questionnaire kind of as a like inside joke because as a linguist you hear this question like all the time uh, from people who think that we just learn languages rather than like collecting VOT data from you know Swahili speakers um, in wherever. Uh, so right, it's just the question that people ask. Um, it's not really a scientific question because you know that question might be answered in a variety of different ways which could seem valid to the people who are answering it. Uh, so different students may have used different criteria to answer this question when they were filling out the background questionnaire. Some students may have only included languages they speak fluently. Others may have included languages they knew less well or had only studied or whatever, right? <clears throat> so if you are a linguist, you probably have studied more than one language. Um, you might speak more than one fluently. Uh, you might have just studied some as, you know, an experimental form or just collected data from them, you know. If we really want to get some sort of meaningful answer, we have to be more specific about what sort of information the you know respondent should give us. Um, so basically, we can't meaningfully answer the question of whether speaking seven languages is an outlier without better knowing what that number represents for each student, basically. Um, and I will say, going back to the example of the reaction time outliers, that's just a case where you know uh, there are sometimes in an experiment you know where certain people will be faster at it and give you, you know, shorter reaction times. And maybe on particular trials, they might be super fast for whatever reason. But if everybody is just sort of consistently giving you reaction times, which are faster than any, you can expect any normal human being to do, um, you probably just have to say, I'm sorry, we have to like toss that data because um, they're just clicking through uh, without thinking about it. Um, yeah, so this brings me up to um, the last kind of pair of points I want to make for this lecture, which is that numbers aren't everything. Uh, so the big picture point number one is that the picture your data paints for you will be most meaningful if your methods of collecting that data are maximally clear and unambiguous. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I don't necessarily want to use the phrase garbage in, garbage out, but you're, yeah, it's kind of like programming a computer in a certain way. It's only going to do what it tells you. Uh, you're, experimental data will kind of only be as good as your methods allow that data to be, I guess is one way to put it. So uh, it's worth it to invest a lot of time in getting uh, sort of the best experiment possible set up. Uh, especially we're linguists, we don't have a lot of resources at our disposal. Uh, and we usually only get one shot at doing them. So make sure you get sort of the best design possible laid out before you actually go run the study. And to a certain extent, obviously that can involve as well doing pilot testing to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, before you like throw everything um, you have into like your dissertation or your thesis or, or what have you. Uh, because there's also big picture point number two, <coughs> which is that stats can't help, can't solve or help you find, sorry, stats cannot solve or help you hide fundamental problems in your data. Um, if you collected the data in some like unvalid way, uh, you're not going to be able to fix that after the fact, which is why, again, invest the time before rather than after. Uh, so designing your study properly and carefully is probably the most crucially important part of the scientific process, at least for us as experimental 
linguists. Um, and as you do so, by the way, it's generally helpful to think about what kinds of statistical analyses you will run for the data you're about to collect before you actually collect that data. Um, so we don't know like how to answer this question now or how to make these plans yet because we're still at the beginning of the semester. But once you learn about the various tests you can run on data that you might collect, um, think about which test would be appropriate as you're designing your study. Uh, go that extra mile to think about like, once I get this data, how am I going to process these numbers and to get something, some sort of meaningful information out of them? Uh, don't think about that late. Think about that early. Um, yeah, uh, this is one case in um, the world where it's better to be early than late. Um, speaking of which, I want to give you one last example, again, from the world of sports. Sorry, I like sports. You're stuck with me if you're watching these videos or taking this class with a sports fan. But here's a real outlier taken from the world of marathon running. Um, so yeah, a marathon is a very long distance to run. Uh, it's 26.2 miles if you're American like me, or if you're like the rest of the world, it's 42.1 kilometers. And the world record, uh, believe it or not, is that uh, somebody from Kenya named Eliud Kipchoge uh, ran that distance in two hours, one minute and 39 seconds. So uh, yeah, people have thought for a long time. When, when I was a kid, I can't remember what the exact, I'm not going to look it up, but I can't remember what the exact record was for the marathon, but it was closer to like two hours, six minutes, something like that, like about 30, 40 years ago. Um, and since then it's like progressed, it's gotten shorter, you know, faster and faster, right? More early than late. Uh, and, and people have thought for a while, like maybe somebody will eventually someday break that two hour barrier. And this guy, Eliud Kipchoge is like a very exceptional runner. Obviously, if you can run that distance in that time, he's very, very good to begin with. Um, and people have thought, well, maybe, uh, you know, a guy like that could break that barrier, even though, uh, he's still like being a minute, 39 seconds away is still a fair amount of time to sort of improve, uh, on that record. Uh, so there's still some distance to go, but in 2019, uh, they set up an event for Elliot to run the marathon distance, just the distance itself as fast as possible. Uh, and they did it using sort of the maximally like optimal conditions for running fast, uh, which are not like, which do not qualify this for a record in the world of marathon running. Um, but they used like a, as flat a course as possible with little wind. They, uh, but they still use pacemakers to provide wind resistance to guys running around him. They, they would like recycle basically uh, to help him keep going at the right pace. And they gave him like water on the fly, so on and so forth. All sorts of cool things just to see, can he get it in under two hours? And it turns out he could. Uh, so he ran that, I think in 159.40. Yeah, so he beat it by 20 seconds, um, which is awesome. But it's not a world record uh, because it wasn't run under the same conditions as like the world record, you know, uh, times are actually run under. Uh, so for instance, like if you run the Boston marathon, um, which is, has various elements that make it more difficult, um, than just like running on a flat course, like there's various hills throughout and so on and so forth. And there's lots of other people, whatnot, uh, competing with you. Um, then if you were able to do that in under two hours, it would be a legitimate record. Um, you can kind of look at, um, this particular time in comparison to, the distribution of times you get in the Boston Marathon or a typical Boston Marathon from 2017. <clears throat> and you can see um, our little histogram here shows you this distribution of times for runners in the Boston Marathon, which kind of looks like a normal distribution, which has this skew over here to the left, which is not surprising because these are the, um, the slower times, right? So this is longer times to complete the distance and this is shorter times to complete the distance. The number of people who can do it shorter drops off pretty radically quickly after you get past sort of the median, which is something like three, 40, three hours, 45 minutes, something like that. Um, yeah, and then when you see you look at the tail here, this is like the people who are world-class runners and the ones competing for like medals in these events. Um, there's just a very few of them, right? Um, and then Kipchoge's record or his unofficial record is way over here under the two hour limit. Uh, and there's this gap between him and the rest of the runners, like 10 minute gap. Uh, so this is like a, a true outlier. Uh, in, it's also the true outlier in the sense that it's not representing the same sort of thing. Number one, it's just a different like event altogether, but also like it was run under these different conditions. It shouldn't count as like a valid data point in your analysis. So uh, if you know that there are these reasons not to include this time, you just have to say, toss it and we'll look at the rest of the data and we'll only analyze that as the sort of meaningful representation of what we were looking for in the first place in our experiment. Um, 
yeah, only going up here to whoever got like two hours and 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, this is kind of a funny um, graph to look at anyways, too. Uh, there's other things that kind of factor in here. So like Elia Kipchoge was trying to beat two hours. Uh, but you can see there are people who are trying to beat other time limits. So like there's these little spikes that you get uh, right before three hours. So there's a number of people who are trying to beat that three hour time limit and then apparently succeeded. Uh, and then a number of people are trying to beat four hours too. a whole bunch of them. In fact, that's right close to the, the mean or the median of this distribution. And there's this big drop off after four hours. So, you know, um, since it's the same event, you got to include those numbers. Um, but in a sense, they're kind of showing you something a little bit different than just like what people would do if they ran this distance without any sense of the time going on. Uh, they These people knew through whatever means that they were close to four, hour, four hours and they wanted to beat that. That was their goal, right? And so that made them a little bit faster. And that's kind of what makes this distribution not as smooth as it might be otherwise. I guess nobody really goes into the Boston Marathon saying, I got to beat five hours. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a schlub as a runner, but uh, I've run a uh, half marathon in around like two hours, 10 minutes. So I'd probably be, I'd be happy to be somewhere in this like four hours to five hours range if I ever run a marathon. And I think most people out here are probably just happy with that too, which is why you don't get the like, yeah, I beat five hours. But maybe there's a little bit, I don't know. Uh, anyways, like other factors can affect these things cause, cause, just because of human consciousness, right? Uh, and what we know about what we're doing. Um, so keep that in mind as you process the data for your experiment. Um, there can be outliers for a variety of reasons. Uh, you should only really exclude outliers from your data set though, if you know, if you have a good reason to do so. Um, using things like box plots just help, that helps you sort of identify what could be a non-legitimate, an illegitimate <laughs> data point for whatever reason. But you have to do your homework beyond that um, if you really wanna exclude it in some sort of meaningful way. Uh, okay, I've talked enough for sure, and I've definitely talked enough about sports, but there's going to be more coming. I'm sorry about it. Uh, but next time, we won't talk about sports. We'll talk about variance and standard deviation, uh, which are really useful for stats purposes. Um, and yeah, so we still have a lot to look forward to. Uh, I'll see you then.